Hello, everyone. Very good afternoon from Singapore, if you are in Singapore. Um, welcome to JCU's webinar series. And today we have um, a lecture by Professor Emmanuel Eregbai. But before I introduce the speaker, I would like to you know, share some of the housekeeping issues. Uh, please note that this, this webinar will be recorded for publicity purposes. Attendees, that means all of you will be able to ask questions at any point of the webinar, but through the Q&A function. So you can probably, you can see the Q&A and the taskbar of your the Zoom room. Question and answer session will be towards the end of the presentation. There will be a satisfaction poll and a survey at the end of the webinar as well. If you experience any technical difficulties, please use the chat button to communicate with event organizers and we will definitely assist you. I have the honor of introducing today's speaker, Professor Emmanuel Eric Byte. Emmanuel Eric Byte is a visiting professor of governance and management at James Cook University. His widely cited research on corporate governance, corporate social responsibility, and corporate finance has been published in world leading academic and professional outlets. His research has received prestigious awards, and in collaboration with others, he has secured close to half a million pounds in funding. Emmanuel works closely with businesses, NGOs, governments in promoting corporate accountability, especially in emerging and developing economies. So before I move on to the next para of the introduction, we have a poll for you. And I will ask my colleague to ask you the question and see and, and, and seek your participation in responding to it. So the question for you all is, Professor Eric Byte also has an academic appointment at this university. And you have four options there. Newcastle, Nile University of Nigeria, Northumbria, and University of Nottingham. So as I can see, responses are pouring in. Come on. Oh, there seems to be a tie at the moment with Nile University of Nigeria and University of Nottingham. Well, this is getting interesting. How come Newcastle University and, and, and Northumbria? Oh, there you go. I just had to say it. And, and now <laughs> I've also started to pour in. But we still have a tie. Being a soccer fan, I don't like draws. I like a clear win. Come on, come on, come on. We'll keep it open for just a few more minutes. And one of the polls take the lead and the poll is closed. So here we have, you know, of course, Nile University of Nigeria, but the winner is University of Nottingham, which is correct. So congrats. Um, let me continue with Professor's uh, introduction. Today, or at this, this seminar uh, lecture, Emmanuel will speak on Africa capitalism. He will argue that Africa capitalism presents itself as an important and novel approach of conceptualizing private sector participation in Africa's socio-economic development. However, this intervention requires a nuanced corporate governance framework that reflects the peculiarities of the concept. In his, in his attempt to do this, he will present a workable, practical and useful corporate governance model to underpin the Africa Capitalism Project. So that takes us to our second question of this poll, and which is, 
What is Africa capitalism? So here we have the three responses. An economic philosophy for prosperity and social wealth. An economic and political system of trade and industry. An African system of private ownership. And responses are coming in fast. And look at that. All three options have at least one or probably more than one responses. We seem to have much higher participation in this than the previous one. We just wait for a little bit longer before we close the poll. So there appears to be a tie. There is a tie, there is a tie. Okay, and here we have closed the poll. So Emmanuel, why don't I ask you to um, share with us and talk to us about, you know, what is Africa capitalism and which of these three options were pretty much correct? Thank you. Thank you, Abhishek, for that uh, wonderful introduction. The first uh, option is the correct answer, an economic philosophy for prosperity and social wealth. But I'm happy that people didn't get it right, because then it, there's a lot to learn to do then. So, uh, so that, that's absolutely fine. Other two responses will have some connections with, with the old project on Africa capitalism. But at the core of it, it's a philosophy. It's a way of thinking uh, that produces a system that produces, you know, um, different orientation towards private ownership, etc. But it is fundamentally a philosophy. So I think it's great that uh, uh, there is a lot of potential for people to learn new things uh, at the webinar today. Thank you. So. And, and please share with us what is the corporate governance and Africa capitalism thought and, and your approach that you would like to share with us, Emmanuel, today. Thank you very much, Abhishek, and thanks, uh, Vini, thanks, uh, Arika, for putting all of these together. So, I'm going to speak on corporate governance and Africa capitalism. And the agenda is to start with this notion of the corporation and try to think about, you know, what do we know about the corporation currently? What do we know about the corporation's philosophy? What do we know about what this philosophy means in terms of governance and accountability and how the firm is regulated? And is this philosophy and is this system that it produces good for the corporation? And if it is not good, is there an alternative system and is there an alternative philosophy that the firm can use to govern itself, particularly in weak institutional environments? So that's the, that's the overarching uh, uh, you know, uh, narrative of what I want to discuss in the next 40 or so minutes. So I thank you all for, for joining. I hope uh, it will be of interest. Now, because I am not super sure where, you know, people are coming from. Some of you have experiences of working with firms. Some of you have experiences of searching on firms. So I'm going to start with some fundamentals, uh, just to make sure we are all on the same page and train uh, as it were. So when we look at firms and when we look at firms in different countries, from the big multinationals, the small companies, when we look at, uh, uh, you know, uh, international business firms, when we look at, uh, you know, local giants, when we look at these firms, one of the key questions that any discussion on governance, any discussion on responsibility and accountability, Indeed, any discussion on the firm uh, would have to answer or indeed starts for, from 
is this notion of, of ownership. And that's why I said that the third option is also, you know, it's, it's important uh, in, in terms of conceiving uh, Africa for housing. But when we look at firms, when we look at, you know, different companies, one key question is who owns the firm? Who owns the firm? Um, I'm not sure if there's a chat box there. If there is, if I'm able to get some responses from participants, that would be great. So who owns the firm? If somebody wants to talk, that's fine, I believe. The question here is who owns... So we move on. And yes, you're getting some responses. Yeah. Um, I can't see the chat. Oh yeah, I got it now. I don't see the chat. There's a response, shareholders. Shareholders. I'm just trying to draw the, okay, yeah, I've got it now. So we've got Kritika, shareholders. Shareholders, thank you very much. Shareholders. So who owns the firm shareholders? And this is correct because shareholders uh, are the private equity providers of the firm and they commit their resources to which the firms are going to work with. So classical economic theory, neoclassical neo neo economic theory would suggest that, you know, there, there are few, and, and if we can just all, you know, pay attention to this school, there are a few things anyone who comes in touch with a firm should know. The first is that there are people called owners. So these are the shareholders. They put in the money, thanks to which the firm is able to operate, and in exchange, society recognizes their rights to call the shots. So society recognizes the right of shareholders to call the shots, to determine what happens with the firm. So despite the boss is self-sufficient here, so that it, in this case, we're talking about the, the management of the company or the CEO of the company, he's a mere standing for the real boss, the shareholders, the owners. Next, owners put their money in the firm expecting rewards. They do not do so out of selflessness, love of neighbor or how the lofty ideal. They expect to earn money after a given time. That is the logic of investment. So this is a quote a, 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 in an article in the Journal of Business Ethics uh, by, by Arthur Paul Sisson about two decades ago. And I think this quote helps to summarize uh, the neoclassical economic perspective of capitalism or of shareholder capitalism, which is, you know, when you buy Microsoft shares, when you buy Amazon shares, when you buy, uh, uh, you know, uh, Zoom shares or Tesla shares, or some of these companies that are doing really well now, you are buying their shares not because you love them or selflessness or because you want to keep people in jobs, you buy them because you want some returns on your investment. And that is the logic of investment, right? So, and I think that's, that's, that's symbolic, the notion of that is the logic. So that's the predominant narrative of investment. And returns are only due in financial times. So if we take this assumption that shareholders own the firm, then we can also ask uh, a question about to whom the firm should be responsible to. That can be a naive question because if, if shareholders own the firm, then they should be responsible to shareholders. I would think. But the complications arising from transferring ownership to mean single, singular recipient, uh, recipient of responsibility has led to so many caveats uh, of modern day capitalism, which we will be talking about today as underpinning uh, our notion of African capitalism. But in, in answer to this question, to whom the firm is responsible, uh, you know, very, very, you know, um, influential economic scholars and business scholars have argued that, well, it should be the firm. So you have people like, uh, 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 Milton Friedman, Nobel, Nobel Prize winner, saying that's, that's a rather naive question because the corporation uh, should be responsible uh, to its owners and that the corporation uh, 
you know, the, the moral responsibility of the corporation is, is to gain large sustainable profit for its own full stop. But this is not just a, a hundred year notion. This is not a hundred year or modern history perspective. Yeah, this is a perspective engraved in, 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 in capitalism, in Western capitalism. Uh, and Adam Smith, for instance, uh, was a great proponent of, of what has been built upon as, as what we recognize to be capitalism today. And his notion was that what matters uh, is, is wealth maximization for the firm, and that is a moral thing to do. And that it, there's nothing immoral about that. And that shareholders own the firm and own the profits of the firm. And it is the right thing to do to get large profits for, for shareholders. And that's a moral practice such that uh, if I need to achieve something, so let's say I'm a business owner, I need workers, or I need people to work for me to generate profit. I also have people on the other hand who want a job. So I need help, they need help. By helping ourselves, we can create a public good, and that's a moral practice, and that's capitalism. So that fundamental thinking uh, centuries ago has helped shape firms, and I've also shaped businesses and governments in their attitude towards firms. So shareholders have answered that, well, yes, the firm is responsible to us. Do you have a problem with that? And that's this fundamental logic uh, on the pain in firms. Uh, from advanced capitalist systems to, to weaker capitalist systems. But again, you know, you take the Hemron scandal, for instance, in 2008, you take the 2008 uh, global financial crisis, you take some of these uh, financial crises uh, that tend to happen, you know, every, every ever so often. And shareholder capitalism is often blamed for these, for these um, uh, corporate misbehaviors and, and the, 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 the orientation towards short term profit, towards you know, uh, and the tyranny of shareholder capitalism has, has often been uh, considered as the parameter underpinning uh, some of the collapses of, of, of world economic systems. So people have talked about, well, you know, can we come back and can we rethink? Can we have, you know, is this the only way we can think about the family? Is, is there a tyranny here? Is there a, a transportation of a wealth Western capitalism across the old, uh, wall? And uh, is this paradigm the only way uh, to, to, to think about the family? On the, on the other hand, some have said, well, come on, capitalism has been responsible for global prosperity, and this is just an onslaught. This is just an unfair attempt to, to criticize a model that has produced so much prosperity across the world. And of course, you have some alternative economic systems. Uh, you, know, uh, you, you know, you have continental Europe, you have Soviet Union uh, decades ago, which have not necessarily uh, transplanted into great economic successes in the way that economic successes will be recognized uh, 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 in the global space. So some have said, well, this is, our, this is our unfair criticism of capitalism. But I think irrespective of where we stand, and this, my, my webinar is not to push in one direction or the other. It's just to sort of create, create um, a sort of innovative space that we can explore alternative logics. But I think irrespective of where we stand, We've, we, we have an opportunity to rethink about who the firm is, how the firm should be governed, and for whom it should be governed. And this takes us to the goal of the firm. This takes us to notions around governance and responsibility. So that's, that's what my, my focus would be. So the maximization of shareholder wealth is argued to be the goal of the firm. And if we think, okay, let's take that as a good assumption, but how do they achieve their goals? Especially in dispersed share ownership structures. So you have, say, you know, big companies like Coca-Cola uh, having many hundreds of thousands of shareholders across the world. 
So if we say shareholders own the firm, how can these shareholders then manage the firm? Because they, they disperse, they have uh, little shares uh, and, and a small number of shares uh, across the board. So how do they achieve their goal? How do they achieve this maximization of shareholder wealth when they're not in charge of the firm? So modern corporate governance discussions uh, began with this orientation of, we have a problem here. Modern capitalism is amounting to different people, sorry, different hundreds of people dispersed, having minority shares in different companies. They then have to appoint people to manage these companies on their behalf. And they then have to appoint boards of directors to monitor these people. So you can see that there's a dispersed ownership there and a conflict may exist between these shareholders and the people they appoint to manage on their behalf. So there's this classical principal agent problem. The principal being the shareholders, the agents appointed to manage on behalf of the principals being the managers. And then a conflict may, may exist. So on the one hand, shareholders want profit, wealth maximization in the form of uh, share price appreciation in the form of dividends appreciation. So they want these things. But on the other hand, uh, agents may want something else. They may want their own profit, their own salary, their own job security, their own um, uh, uh, reputation. And they may further their own self-interest at the interest at the expense of the principal. So there's a classical agency problem there. The agency problem is based on the fact that there is separation of ownership and control. So shareholders own the firm, but they're not in control of the firm. That could be goal incongruence in the sense that what managers want is not what shareholders want. But more importantly, there's a symmetry of information. So managers know far more about the prospects of the business, about the competition in the business, about the likelihood of the share price going up and down, and they are in a position of information uh, imbalance. So they know far more than the owners of the business, and they can run the firm um, to their own advantage uh, at times. So because of these three problems, corporate governance discussions began as an attempt to address these problems. That Yes, we said wealth maximization is good for the firm, but in achieving these, firms put in managers, and these managers can run the business, not necessarily in the interest of shareholders. So how can we deal with this problem? So given these three factors, how can we ensure that wealth of shareholders are protected? So corporate governance is an attempt to solve these agencies' problem, uh, to ensure that the company's assets are used by managers to maximize share. Now that's the shareholder perspective on corporate governance, or the shareholder capitalism perspective in corporate governance. There are multiple other perspectives that I won't say much about, but of note is the stakeholder orientation towards corporate governance, which suggests that, well, corporate governance should not just be as an element of accountability, as a system of accountability of managers towards shareholders in maximizing shareholder wealth. It should be towards stakeholders. So that includes employees, suppliers, government, etc., uh, such that the, the firm is governed in a way that delivers value to these multiple stakeholders, of which shareholders uh, would be one of them. But another view, which I've used uh, mainly in my own research, is the institutional uh, theorizing of corporate governance, which tends to pay attention to national level institutional factors, but also firm level institutional uh, factors that guide and shape the legitimacy of corporate governance uh, in different institutional environments and pays attention to the strength of institutions as, as guiding forces uh, uh, that either make corporate governance systems weak, effective, or, 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 or irrelevant. So I've used these uh, institutional uh, theorizing 
uh, which pays attention to things like the norms, the value, the state of the economy, the culture, uh, path dependency, and some of these institutional variables as determining factors uh, of corporate governance legitimacy. I think this institutional view is exceptionally, ex especially useful when you look at corporate governance in weak and emerging markets, say from China, uh, you want to look at the role of the state, for instance, you want to look at state ownership, and you don't want to transfer your shareholder orientation towards corporate governance as enough explanation. Also, you may have a different type of agency problem. So the agency problem I talked about earlier is the classical type one agency problem, which is you have dispersed shareholdership, then you have these uh, managers uh, and you have an agency problem between them. What you may have in less dispersed ownership uh, uh, structures is where you have majority shareholders who are also in charge of the company. So there's no separation of ownership at that level. You have the majority shareholders and they are also in charge. So you don't have a separation there. What you have a separation is within, between the majority shareholders and the minority shareholders, which is evident in many weak institutional environments. So because you have these sort of different dichotomies, it's important to uh, move a little bit away from the agency approach to corporate governance and look at other uh, uh, theoretical attempts, in this case, institutional theory. Uh, and I found this useful in expanding corporate governance uh, in countries such as Nigeria, uh, where a lot of my work has been published. So talking about Nigeria, I think this institutional narrative is important because it helps us also to understand the corporate governance system, how it has developed over time, uh, the elements that it needs to be nurtured and sustained over time, but also the drivers of its efficiencies and the, uh, the inhibitors uh, of, 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 you know, of the system trying. And that's important. If you take uh, Nigeria, for instance, and, and you compare with, say, countries even within Africa, you find out that uh, some governance indicators are weak. So you have system, the, the political system, uh, political stability, uh, absence of violence and terrorism, ETC, government effectiveness, regulatory quality, rule of law, control of corruption. You can see that some countries do far better than others. And again, if you now position firms within these countries, you've got to adopt a different attitude and a different understanding uh, to their governance because they're situated within different uh, institutional environments. So that's why institutional theory often uh, becomes useful. I'm saying a little bit more about the, the uh, firm embedded in, 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 in weak institutional context. So we started the discussion looking at the firm, the ownership of the firm, and then we looked at and we said the ownership of the firm, shareholders on the firm, you know, and then the firm is responsible to shareholders. But we said, well, that's fine, but how do shareholders that are dispersed, how do they ensure how uh, that the firm is managed to maximize their wealth? Then that took us into corporate governance discussion, which, uh, which is an attempt to monitor agents, to reward principals uh, with, with wealth maximization. And now we, we, we're in turbulent institutional context, marred by corruption. And we're now looking at, well, how can firms do this when they're embedded in weak institutional environments, when the state is weak, when the uh, capital markets are, are ineffective, when uh, you don't necessarily have a lot of dispersed shareholders and you have majority ownership structures, where you have interlocking of shares. Now, what sort of governance or what sort of notion of firm responsibility is appropriate for this environment, right? So, so, so that's, that's the discussion up till now. And that's particularly important. So in about, uh, I think about 10 or so now, actually more than 10 years, about 12 or so years ago, uh, the Nigerian banking sector uh, went through a period of, of, of significant turmoil. And, and this has happened, uh, in, in the past uh, as well, before, before the last 12 years. But particularly in the last 12 years, you had about six or so uh, uh, managing directors of banks or CEOs of banks uh, charged for corruption, uh, uh, removed from their banks. And these are banks that have rewarded uh, shareholders 
for, for, for a period of you know, previous five years. Some of these uh, chief executives actually received uh, awards uh, uh, as being, you know, very excellently uh, managed banks, etc. etc. So that brings to mind, if we use this notion of shareholder governance, shareholder capitalism system of governance, in countries such as these, where there is corruption, there's corporate corruption, where the state is ineffective, where the regulators are weak and uh, regulation, regulations are easily circumvented. What is the alternative model of capitalism that we need? And what sort of governance framework will that capitalism philosophy lead to? So that takes us to this, this notion of, okay, let's, let's sit back and think, what is really the issue here? So it's not that firms are crazy. It's not that banks are crazy and they do terrible things. We say, we say firms, the notion of the entrepreneurial fund is, is a great thing. They create jobs, consumer welfare, economic development, they pay taxes. These taxes are used to, to, to improve the, the, you know, uh, the state, the, the, the country, provide infrastructure. Uh, many companies also help in skills development, ETC. So the firm is not demonized in, or shouldn't be demonized in, in any capitalism or orientation. But what we're trying to do is to draw attention to this conventional shareholder construct and look at, well, if firms do these positive things, so let's call them positive externalities, they create jobs, but they also do some not so good things. So you have things like pollution, environmental degradation, exploitation of labor, human rights abuses, fraud, corporate manslaughter. Uh, so you've also had, or we've also had uh, aspects of the firm that are not so good. So we can call these negative externalities. So firms do positive things, so they have positive outcomes, but also, they also have negative outcomes. And can we, not just move away from these negative outcomes, but can we look at, okay, what sort of capitalism system responds to these negative externalities? So what do we mean by externality? When you do not consent to something, to an economic exchange, and that economic exchange creates harm for you. So economists stuff called is market failure. Okay, uh, it's, it's market failure. It's the social cost uh, of economic activities. Uh, but at times, this cost may exceed the benefits of, 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 so that you have more negative externalities than positive externalities. And this cost I imposed on non-consenting parties. So if you take countries like Nigeria or countries in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, if you take Sudan, if you take Congo, if they get in a lot of these countries, there has been significant negative effect of capitalism behavior on constituents and in local economies and villages uh, in terms of their livelihood, say the Niger Delta region of Nigeria. You have oil and gas activities on the one hand, but you also have a lot of environmental degradation. You have aquatic life uh, destroyed. You have livelihoods destroyed you have farmlands destroyed, and you also have, you know, uh, the popular narrative of blood diamond uh, in many other African countries. So you have conflicts arising from, from, from some of these phosphor uh, taken up of, of resources, ETC, uh, in these countries. So it just draws our attention to, these, to the extent of these negative externalities and how we can resolve them. So this is just a very uh, simple example of what uh, an externality uh, could be. And let's look at previous attempts to solve these externalities. So take, you know, you go for a meal and it's an enclosed environment and you have an quiet meal with your friend and then the, the chap is smoking and you get some passive smoke. And of course that then leads to you uh, perhaps not feeling well over a period of time. 
organism passive smoke, maybe that endangers your health, and maybe you find yourself in the hospital, ETC, ETC. So there's, there's a cost to yourself, there's a cost to the health system. So let's look at how firms have, uh, so take British American tobacco, for instance. So what can British American tobacco do? Uh, they can, you know, halter their price dynamics and say, well, yeah, we want people to smoke less, so let's increase the price of, of, of cigarettes. And if they do that, maybe people will smoke less, right? So they play with the price dynamics and price quantity dynamics to influence behavior in customers. But if they do that, and another tobacco company does not, then they lose market share because then they lose their customers. So the firm's attempt in play, playing with price may not necessarily be successful or sustainable over time if there is no uh, uh, joint effort with, with other businesses. So that's the firm's attempt. There's been other attempts. Uh, so the government has tried to step into externalities and look at, well, you know, let's come up with regulation. Let's come up with, with law and let's ensure that, you know, criminal behaviors are punished. Let's ensure that they are more stringent regulations. Let's ensure the environmental controls. So you have the highest ISO standards ETC. Well, let's come up with taxes. So these are classical uh, economic approach to, uh, to resolving social cost as externalities. Let's, let's increase taxes. So we pay a lot of tax on alcohol, for instance. We pay a lot of tax on tobacco. Let's increase the taxes on, on these items uh, that are not seen uh, as good. Or let's leave it to the market. So economists uh, uh, in the Chicago School uh, have talked about poison bagging. So Ronald Coles talks about this and said, well, let's leave it to the market. Let's have the person or the company creating the ham bagging with the recipient of the ham. And, and let's, let's, so let's take Niger Delta again. So let the oil and gas bag in with the communities and say, well, we're going to pollute your water because we want to get oil out of these, uh, out of the ground. But we're going to give you some money. Are we going to resettle you somewhere? We're going to build houses for you. Are we going to give you um, uh, some palliatives? So let's bag it, right? So that's the, that's, that's, that's the uh, economic approach, classical economic approach. And of course, you have, uh, uh, you know, scholars who have criticized that and said, well, you know, coercion bargaining doesn't necessarily work. So in this case, you have the oil and gas uh, businesses. They know far more than the stakeholders, than the community people. And can, they, can the community people actually bag in well? Do they have a full understanding of the impact, of the environmental impact of what they're bargaining on, right? So, Another approach uh, that has gained momentum in the, in the last uh, three or four decades is this notion of CSR. And together with colleagues, uh, uh, we just recently wrote a paper uh, that used CSR, that attempted to use CSR as a way to resolve externalities. But just as a background, externalities have been addressed, you know, we've talked about law, we've talked about taxes, in bargaining, and now I'm talking about CSR. So these are prior attempts to address externalities. And I think this is a very interesting paper uh, recently published in the Journal of Research. And, and, and centrally, what we argued was let's make CSR not just uh, obligatory, uh, uh, oh, sorry, not just um, voluntary, but a legal uh, obligatory entity. Uh, I uh, uh, encourage colleagues or uh, listeners to read. But coming back, what I want to do in the next uh, 20 or so minutes is look at whether there is a fourth possibility. So whether it's law, whether it's taxes, whether it's markets, whether it's CSR, these do not necessarily pay attention to the local specificities and the local institutional context that firms are embedded. So we see when we move to Africa, is there a fourth possibility? And that the firm can use to govern itself to resolve some of the tensions uh, that we've been talking about. So essentially, the question is, how can firms by themselves create wealth for shareholders and society uh, through good corporate governance? So can Afro-capitalism be a solution to these externalities, to these governance problems uh, we've been talking about? And what would that look like? What would 
an Afro-capitalist corporate governance model, what will it look like? So in 2013, I think, I believe, um, uh, I, I was at Durham University at the time. I, was, uh, I co founded a research center on ethics, organization, and society. And together with colleagues, uh, uh, we, colleagues across different, uh, different countries, uh, particularly the University of Edinburgh, where Kenneth Amishi uh, works, uh, we started this notion of working on a research project on, on African capitalism. So uh, we, the project was called the Edinburgh Project, led by Kenneth. And what we did was to look at how can we interrogate and expand these notion of African capitalism and what does it mean in terms of theory, in terms of practice. And, and it was a big uh, 310,000 uh, pounds funded project where we intellectually interrogated the concept, defined uh, its, its boundaries and attempted to position it uh, as a capitalism construct uh, suitable for us. So the few universities in, in, in involved and our, 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 you know, our motivation was, you know, when you look at Africa, you know, on the one hand, you have a, you have a lot of great stuff, right? You have you know, young population, entrepreneurial population, seven of the fastest growing economies in Africa, low factors of production. You have huge natural resources, from gold to oil to diamond, you have all of these things. You also have a, a sense of connection, a people connected by some sense of religion. Uh, you have some community, uh, 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 you know, feel in Africa. Then, on the other hand, you don't have so many negative stuff. So you have prosperity on the one hand and a lot of poverty on the other hand. So majority of the poorest nations in the world are also in Africa. And there's a bit of an oxymoron between these great stuff and this other stuff, the environmental damage, the human rights abuses, the pollution, the poverty, the diseases, the insecurity, the corruption. So there's an oxymoron there. How can firms respond to this oxymoron? How can firms use their governance to resolve these prosperity on the one hand and poverty on the other? So how can firms be agents of positive social change? in this week institutional environment. So a gentleman, uh, Tony Lumelu, uh, coined the, the Afro-capitalism construct. Uh, uh, he was a Nigerian banker and an economist as well. And the notion was that Afro-capitalism embodies a private sector commitment to the economic uh, emancipation of, of Africa. So it's a private sector commitment. It's to say, well, uh, firms are committed to socioeconomic development and firms will not leave the role only to government. They're committed to it through investments that generate economic prosperity and social wealth. So African firms are not just profit-seeking firms or shouldn't be profit-seeking firms, but they, they have a deep commitment, a sense of uh, commitment to confronting uh, this oxymoron we've talked about. So the African capitalist firm is not motivated by profit only, but also has a social mission. And it rests on this, this Ubuntu philosophy. So Ubuntu talks about, uh, I am who I am because of horse. So it, it starts from this notion of we rather than I. It starts by understanding that firms are, are, are a community and that when I think about what I want to do, I have to think about what the community wants and I achieve what I want through what the community wants. So there's group solidarity, there's participation, there's a sense of interdependency. So it's not just a buzzword. It's, it's a customized economic philosophy that pays attention to context, that pays attention to place, that pays attention to, to culture. So it's an emotive construct. 
It's a social uh, and it's a li linguistic artifact. So it's not CSR. It's, it's a new way of thinking about the firm, thinking in relation to the firm. So there are four key uh, notions of, of, or key cardinal values uh, uh, of African capitalism. The very first one is a sense of progress and prosperity. So this is to say that, you know, we're not just saying, I mean, one of the slides I shared earlier talked about uh, the seven largest, seven fast growing economies being, being in Africa. But this is the sense of progress and prosperity goes beyond that. It's saying, well, social wealth and financial prosperity need to lead to progress. And that goes beyond material accumulation. That goes beyond uh, uh, GDP or other economic measures of prosperity. It includes a psychosocial uh, level of prosperity that is beyond material accumulation. So it's not just the absence of poverty, but it is the conditions that make life better, that make life more livable. So we're talking about uh, you know, quality education, we're talking about uh, social capital development, we're talking about uh, democratic institutions and some of this stuff. Another value of African capitalism is a sense of parity. So often you talk about economic development and you find out that that is lopsided and that uh, some parts of the country or some part of the continent developing at the expense of others. So there is no shared prosperity. So there's increase in GDP, but there's still increase in poverty. And it's very easy uh, for the accumulation of wealth uh, to, to be lopsided. And just a particular group of people are benefiting uh, from that uh, increase in, in wealth for the country. So sense of parity talks about resolving inequality. So ensuring that prosperity is shared. The thought is a sense of peace and harmony. And I think this is very important. So particularly, at, uh, I made reference to the Manja Delta region uh, uh, the other time. So often insecurity and, and turbulence uh, and some of these things, even as far as uh, terrorism, etc., often uh, uh, thrive when there is no uh, corporate response uh, in, in, in terms of sharing wealth. So uh, whilst capitalism can be very innovative, it can also lead to some sort of creative destruction. And that's just what you see uh, when there is no peace and, uh, and, and, and harmony. So capitalism or half capitalism helps to address this, this need for peace and harmony and resolve these imperfections of, 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 of you know, dominant uh, uh, shareholder capitalism. So there has to be economic prosperity, but there has to be also some social environmental uh, 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 balance because the imbalance of these is, is also dangerous to the longevity of, of, of the firm. So we're talking about ecological prosperity. We're talking about environmental prosperity, which are good for peace and harmony of a particular uh, uh, environment or business environment. What I like most about these cardinal values of African capitalism is the fourth one, which is a sense of place and belongingness. And, and I think that is what characteristically distinguishes African capitalism from, say, your Michael Potter's, uh, uh, creating shared value or other orientations uh, or, or other alternative source uh, capitals. So often, if you take the international business firm, the international business firm will see, say, uh, business environment as spaces or locations for doing business. So say McDonald's, for instance, you want to go to um, you know, a new market, you think, well, yes, this is a new market. This is a business environment, full stop. And what will thrive in this business environment? Let us sell this product, let us uh, uh, make sure our product fits this local environment so that we can make profit. But what African capitalism tends to do, or in this case, McDonald's would still be, if you like, a typical American firm with its American capitalism philosophy. And say Kenya, 
is just a business environment to do business. So what would matter to McDonald's would be factors of production, ETC, uh, market evaluation, profit potential, ETC, ETC, full stop. And that is good. But what African capitalism tries to draw attention to is that firms can have a sense of place and belongingness, some sort of nationalism, patriotism, the type uh, that you, you had in, say, continental Europe post uh, World War II, for instance, uh, the type that you had in China as well, that economic patriotism that says that, well, I am a firm and a member of this environment. This is my place. I belong here. I want to thrive and do well and leave, uh, create economic and social prosperity. I want to create jobs, ETC, here. So there's a fundamental uh, difference in being, say, in, in how the market environment is conceptualized by the African capitalist firm. The African capitalist firm is not just focusing on cost and opportunities, but it's also looking at potential for societal development, potential for making that place a better place. So, so there's a sense of place rather than business space, rather than business environment. Uh, that characterizes international business firms. So these are critical relations uh, of what African capitalism uh, uh, means. So African capitalism can then give private governance of externalities. So we're talking about externalities, we're talking about creating harm and, and, and the social cost. But the African capitalist firm, with this sense of place and belonging, with a sense of peace and harmony, with a sense of uh, uh, parity and with this sense of um, uh, shared prosperity or, or, or um, uh, sense of uh, creating economic wealth and social wealth can be a very useful nuance to seeing their role in society and then hopefully can help in resolving uh, this externality. So, so what we're trying to do is to say African capitalism corporate governance framework can help the firms to voluntarily reduce their negative externalities and then be more committed towards creating more, more social wealth. So uh, a colleague of mine, Kenneth, uh, uh, came up with this model, which I think is very useful. And I think African capitalism here what, what, it, what, what, it, what it allows us to do is to position the firm as part of its own governance mechanism. So we're not saying African capitalism does not need regulation or the markets or institutions or networks or civil society. We're saying African capitalism can be part of this network system of governance where the firm is able to self-regulate itself based on its philosophy. And this would then determine the kind of governance mechanism that it has. So, particularly in weak institutional context, I've also argued that uh, you, you need a strong state, a legal environment, ETC, to ensure that the African capitalism function uh, translates entrepreneurial economic behavior into social action. So, what can drive an African capitalism? or African capitalist uh, firm, what can make a business adopt this African capitalist uh, philosophy? So a lot of uh, our research on African capitalism and in other uh, areas uh, of CSR, we think the motives can be normative. So businesses can adopt this because they feel it's the right thing to do. Because the leadership have some beliefs and values and, uh, and some level of private morality that rests heavily or that connects with this African capitalism uh, philosophy. And when you have a few companies doing that, that can lead to some stakeholder pressure. So because three companies in, in the industry that are the market leaders have adopted this, that can lead to some legitimacy pressure. And then other businesses feel the need to connect with this. And that has happened with constructors of CSR, for instance. So there's a stakeholder pressure. There's an expectation on firms to, to, to respond 
by adopting this philosophy. But it's also the instrumental motif. You can have businesses doing these because there is an expectation and there is a reward for doing it. So businesses like them and then they get more commercial opportunities because they get more reputation as a result. There can also be some risk uh, mitigation uh, because of the social uh, value that they create. So there's a notion of, of doing well by doing good there. And we think some of these can be the drivers and motivations of the Afro-capitalist. So in other words, the Afro-capitalism construct can provide some sort of institutional immunity. So you see a firm operating in this weak institutional environment where there's corruption, uh, where there's negative externalities, and the firm thinks, how can I thrive as a business, reward my shareholders, but also create social wealth in this environment? What sort of economic philosophy do I need in transforming this entrepreneurial talent into uh, economic and social wealth? And I think that's where African capitalism acts as a buffer from that weak institutional environment in allowing the firm uh, to do this. Uh, I'll, I'll skip this, um, but for the interest of you know, academic uh, members of the audience, uh, what we've also tried to do is to theorize these, these notion of you know, what sort of economic theorizing, uh, socioeconomic theorizing would allow us to be able to bring together uh, governments and capitalism. And one of the things I think is that that, that would require a multi or eclectic theoretical, theoretical approach that takes shelter, shareholder wealth optimization on, on the one hand uh, and social wealth on the other. But I think there would also be some borrowing from uh, legitimacy theory and some other social philosophies uh, in trying to uh, theorize this, this uh, African socioeconomic uh, approach to prosperity. But in being more practical, so if you were a company, you were a bank or a multinational and you think, okay, I like this African capitalism idea, but what do I do? What does it mean in practice for me? Right? One of the things I've, I've also tried to do is to come up with a very simplistic way of looking at it and transforming it in a corporate governance model. So I think in the, in the, the individual level, you're a board director, you're a chairman, a CEO of a company, don't turn a blind eye. You want to make a business decision, look at the broad spectrum of the, you know, of the, of the cost and benefits of the decision. Don't turn a blind eye to the social implications. Don't turn a blind eye, be good. At the individual level. Don't be selfish, there's an individual governance level there and you know one of the drivers is private morality. So it relies heavily on private morality. So the, I think this speaks to who you are as a person. Then as a company that should translate into what you do as, as, a, as a company. So that leads to governing externalities, preventing harm, but also it has a little bit of wisdom in decision making, stakeholder management managing people and the aim is shared prosperity all right there's economy there's nation building uh, and in terms of the drivers and feeders into these uh in places like nigeria or most of africa that, that that's there's a lot of community orientation there's a lot of influences from religion and it is a wheel and character and i think some of these things can feed into the sort of broad leadership that drive an african capitalism corporate governance system but also looking at the extant literature on corporate governance, uh, there's a huge literature on, on uh, governance and responsibility uh, uh, suggests that more women on board leads to a better decision making in terms of more responsible decision, in terms of more social, so, proper social investment, ETC. Uh, I've also talked about uh, this African capitalism committee and you have, you know, some companies have board ethics committee have something like the African Capitalism Committee, which would be a soundboard for board decisions, for board decisions. And if it doesn't, you know, if a huge investment that will have a lot of negative impact on some negative impact, that would need to be passed through the African Capitalism Committee. So that's a bit of an ethics control uh, within the board. They also have some happy capitalism impact shares, uh, which may be, you know, attracting no dividends, but a high voting power. And that would be, you know, that could be bought by government, NGOs, philanthropies, 
and then they can be able to exert some level of control and some level of uh, influence in, in, in firms uh, not creating externalities or negative externalities. So these are just some of the things that African capitalism can rely on in practice uh, to foster uh, it, it, its acceptance. So I also talked about uh, things like African capitalism governance uh, index or scorecard. So you have the standards and polls, uh, you have some of these governance indicators. So it, you know, it, it can also be a useful way to look at African capitalism uh, being embedded and being encouraged across the board. So sort of bringing some of these to a close, I think what I've tried to do is to question the shareholder, Africa, uh, shareholder capitalism and say, well, you know, that is not the only way to think and that is not the only way firms can behave. And whilst African capitalism itself uh, uh, may have a lot of challenges, may have a lot of um, particularly challenges in, in its implementation, uh, so together with colleagues uh, at JCU, Jacob Wood, we've just written a paper uh, that's a bit of a critique of African capitalism. So we're aware of, of some of the challenges of African capitalism, uh, but nonetheless, we think uh, we, or it helps us to, to uh, conceive at least an alternative uh, to the dominant Often, global capitalism, you know, talks about wealth creation. It talks about, you know, wealth creation, wealth creation, wealth creation. But if you move, particularly again, with reference to sub-Saharan Africa, uh, you question whether uh, wealth has been created or for, or for whom is wealth created. What you see is impoverishment. What you see is poverty. What you see is negative externalities. And then you question to say. It may be world, wealth creation on the one hand, but it, maybe it's more of wealth absorption uh, in, 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 in the vast majority of circumstances and, and wealth, wealth um, removal, I suppose, from one country to the other. But it also helps us to think about this obsession with the entrepreneur uh, as, as the, you know, the, the savior the one coming to create jobs, ETC. And it takes our attention away from that and looks at, oh, well, the, the entrepreneur is, is a community member uh, and the entrepreneur is part and parcel of the community uh, uh, and a social agent rather than, if you like, the, the, the savior uh, that has come to make things uh, 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 better, uh, particularly in, in countries such as uh, in so to put this to a close, um, is capitalism rede redeemable? So I think these are some of the thoughts I would like to, to leave you with. Uh, uh, capitalism itself should be interrogated, otherwise we fall into the same conspiracy of the question uh, capitalism constructs. Should this concept of capitalism Oh, sorry, shareholder capitalism be, be de declared dead. Uh, I, think, I think these are things we can, we can think about. We can think about these, these uh, you know, as living thoughts. Um, and maybe African capitalism uh, can be a new way uh, to think, particularly uh, for countries in, in, in Africa. So I'm going to uh, come to a close now. Um, We've recently uh, published uh, a chapter uh, on, on some of the things I've shared now. Uh, it's in a book uh, uh, published uh, a couple of years ago. I would encourage you to have a look. And after this presentation, I'll just send um, some of the materials for this presentation uh, uh, to share with participants. And also, uh, Will Africa Capitalism Work is a forthcoming paper Myself, Jacob, and Ladisi, where we uh, looked at how African capitalism itself can be made better and uh, can be encouraged uh, in terms of uh, a critic or even in terms of uh, recommend recommendation for its future uh, development.
So I think that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, that's my email. I uh, would like to hear your thoughts. I think we can go into questions and answers now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Um, this was very insightful. Of course, you know, being a person who's always interested in corporate governance, uh, I think you have um, you have created that sense of urgency, and even in my thinking about whether the current notion of corporate governance should remain, or how Africa or African capitalism could be, you know, could be implemented in, in as part of the corporate governance norms and nuances. Well, I can see that there are several questions which are waiting for you, and and I hope um, you don't mind taking some of those questions. Okay, I'll I'll go Fantastic. straight. Thank you, Abhishek. Is there a better modern? Is there if there is a better modern way of doing business? What does think are key issues to be addressed? I think there is a better. Or if you want, I can summarize some of these questions for you. Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to understand that question. But I, if I understand it, and, and like I said, I'm, I'm going to share uh, some of the materials after now. Uh, I, I'm guessing this question would have been asked earlier on in the presentation. Uh, but I did get to a slide where I looked at African capitalism in practice. And that's what I think about. Uh, how doing business can look like with an African capitalism orientation. So it's at uh, the individual level, be good, it's about who you are, and it's also about the corporate level, about what you do. So there is a personal and corporate responsibility in that space. The second question is given the connotations that capitalism has, and, and that you have acknowledged in your presentation, is there a better way to brand and refer to African capitalism? to benefit businesses in Africa. Uh, Emmanuel, if yeah. you're not going to use the presentation, is it possible for you to stop sharing so that we can have a full view? Oh, yes. Fantastic, it's much better. So you can see me now, yeah? Yes, we all can see you. Yes, thank you. Uh, we'll be more representative of what is drawing as uh, an acceptable logic of the enterprise. But I think, you know, the, the issue is when you say the people, who are the people, right? So who are the people? Often we look at the people as the stakeholders. Um, but also it doesn't end there. So if you look at our firms are judged, if you look at our firms are rewarded and uh, if you look at the reward structure of firms in terms of their share price, in terms of uh, uh, their profitability, ETC, who buys or who is ready to buy a product at a higher price because the product has been more uh, environmentally friendly sourced, for instance, right? So when we say the people, the people the, the firm is not just the, the firm is not just the one with the responsibility. Even the stakeholders have the responsibility. The customers, the investors have to uh, have a sense of rewarding, uh, uh, if you like, good firms. So if I know that if I'm a company, if I am a supermarket, and I don't undercut my suppliers in order to sell cheap products or cheaper products, and I pay the farmers well, right? And they're able to live good lives and develop themselves. And as a result, I'm selling my, my beverage or my, you know, um, chocolate uh, in the supermarket, a little bit more. Will you as a customer be happy to pay a little bit more because it's a better, you know, more responsibly sourced product. So the people here, the business should respond and, and be, be used to serve the people, but the, the people also have to serve the business, if that makes sense. So the business that serves the people needs to be served and needs to be encouraged as well. So I think that's a, a good question. I think uh, 
So do you think tagging good behavior to corporate taxation through a grid system may work that is tax bad companies more, good ones less? I think businesses often uh, have, have already been taxed. So if you look at how I talked about the different approaches to resolving externalities, taxation is one of those. And that's the PIGU approach to resolving externalities. Uh, but the problem with taxation, as well as squeezing banking in, is that it is ex post. So the harm has already been done before the government will realize that, okay, I've got to tax this behavior. So the bad behavior will already have occurred. So it's an ex post rather than ex ante approach to externality. What we're talking about with Africa Vitalism is that it's a self governance. So it prevents the harm rather than corrects the harm. It prevents the harm from being done in the first place. But taxation only responds to the harm that has been done. There needs to be laws to make sure businesses are socially responsible and sustainably. So I think that's important. Of course, we've talked about the law uh, approach to externalities as well. But again, the law has its limitation. The law also tends to play a catch up. Uh, uh, but also the law cannot predict behavior. The law cannot predict business environment and circumstances, cannot predict decision-making of, of firms. And firms would need to do something bad first before we recognize it into the law. So investors putting in money, if capitalism has the right idea, how does it compare with Chinese and American factory firms? So I think one of the things I talked about was also that African capitalism bears some semblance with what you, you know, in the 60s and 70s, the economic nationalism of China. And you can see uh, you know, the kind of prosperity uh, that it has produced. So African capitalism in terms of its sense of place and belongingness also uh, has some connections with, with economic uh, nationalism. Is there really a good way for profit businesses to operate then since they all be going from jobs well to suction? If I understand this, this other question, I think what we're trying to do is African capitalism is a thinking heart, right? It's a thinking heart that businesses can adopt. Now that thinking heart produces a governance system that is different, that that uh, encourages the creation of social and economic wealth. So Africa capitalism is not in the action. Africa capitalism, it's in the philosophy, it's in the thinking. And you can have two businesses, one with an Africa capitalism way of thinking, do something exactly the same as somebody without that Africa capitalism way of thinking. And you can also have the complete opposite and to do something different. So Africa capitalism is not simply uh, what you would be able to, uh, an African capitalist firm is not who you would simply be able to identify by their actions. It, it is by looking at a set of their actions and their philosophy. In the context of Africa, corruption, weak governance and poor infrastructure will naturally remain huge stumbling blocks, that's correct. In striving the qualities of the computing. <laughs> what additional steps can be taken to remedy this. I, I really don't have an answer to that question. You're very correct. Um, you talked about uh, selfishness of corrupt overlords. I think, I think that's important. Uh, and I honestly don't have an easy answer to that. Uh, but I think one of the things we talked about uh, in, my, in my presentation was also that African capitalism is not simply, oh, you know, the, it's not simply the magic wand that would resolve all problems, right? You need support from the state. You need support uh, uh, from the capital markets. You need support from civil society. You need, uh, and that's what we talk about, the drivers, the, the drivers, the instrumental, uh, the legitimacy drivers, and the private morality drivers. So private morality on its own, Afro-capitalism cannot survive on it because private morality is in itself uh, a difficult construct. So, because Abhishek is my friend, I may be nicer to Abhishek. Because Vinay is not my friend, I may not be so nice to Vinay. 
So even private morality is a difficult construct. We're nicer to our friends and family. So if you have a son or a daughter, for instance, you're nicer to that son uh, you know, than you would be to another person, for instance. So private morality has been criticized or can be criticized. And that's why we looked at the different aspects of African capitalism. It's, it's not enough to, to, to have private morality. And when, it, when, it's, when it's only rested in private morality, for instance, if you have the CEO change, not the board chairman change, and we've seen this in different firm behavior, where the CEO is changed and the firm starts to behave completely different, right? So it is not enough for private morality. So you're, you're correct. You have to rely on other constructs, uh, and this includes the state, uh, et cetera. I think you've sort of answered all the questions yep. you can see. So you have. So thanks for that. I was going to help out, but um, uh, you, you, there is one that Thomas has just written. Um, you know, that's the last one. Um, I read that the principal. Okay, <laughs> that's a very good question. Yeah. So, so I'm not sure whether Thomas uh, joined us at the very beginning, but one of the things I said was, so what Tony Lumilu did was to coin the word. And what we did for about three or four years uh, with, with colleagues in Africa and universities in UK, US, I'm not sure we had US, but certainly in Canadian universities, was to expand the focus. So you're right, Daniel Lumelo did not talk about corporate governance, he only talked about African capitalism. And then what we did was through the African Capitalism Institute, we got some funding uh, uh, through the Daniel Lumelo Foundation to look at the philosophy of it, define the philosophy, expand it. So that's where all these cardinal values ETC came from. But what I've done is in my, my own research is mainly in corporate governance in, in emerging markets. And what I've done is to take that a bit, some steps further, and then take up a governance literature and African capitalism and try to do some interesting things. So what I hope has been interesting uh, with it. So, Corporate governance and Africa capitalism is my own uh, is my own singular uh, uh, yeah attempt. Uh, are you comfortable with taking a couple of more questions? Um, yes, I think we've got five minutes. Yeah, fantastic. So we got one more by C. Uh, he said he, she they are asking uh, how elevated standards in Africa capitalism makes differences in emerging economies. I'm not super sure I, how, uh, I'm interpreting that to mean how can we elevate the standards of African capitalism in making a difference in emerging economies. I think it is true this. So if you look at the, if I, uh, I think that my, my penultimate slide, you would see a picture of Tony Lumelu and Bill Gates at the uh, World Economic Forum. Uh, let me see if I can share that again. But anyway, so it's one of those pictures. So th there's a lot of momentum. Uh, Tony Lumelu spoke about Africa capitalism, or spoken about Africa capitalism uh, at the Wall State. So I'm having interesting conversations about uh, Africa capitalism uh, with people in Singapore, in China, and, and of course the Wall. And that's great. So we're trying to dip in uh, the conversation. Uh, we've been able to. Uh, published a book, we've written journal articles, etc. So we, we're trying to give the notion some momentum. And, you know, uh, you, you're part of it now. And uh, uh, by all means, uh, helping, helping uh, you know, pushing, pushing the narrative. And the last question, I have a different take. If capitalism is done right, corporate governance is embedded in the original principles. You're correct, you're correct. So. Uh, and that's why we talked about this African capitalism corporate governance system. Now, the reason why good corporate governance is not necessarily African capitalism corporate governance is simply because if you take a broader view of the literature and you look at mainstream finance literature on corporate governance, if you look at innovative and you know uh, topical works of say uh, people like Schiffler and Vishni. Uh, they've talked about uh, corporate governance being uh, a system of accountability of senior management to shareholders, full stop. 
So good corporate governance is defined as a system that rewards shareholders because it's based on the shareholder orientation of capitalism. But Afro-capitalist corporate governance is not that. Is not that. It's based on a wider orientation of the firm as an agent of social change and not just economic change. That's where the difference is. Uh, I think I'll stop now. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, we are coming close to the to the hour. But I'll ask one final question, if if you if you permit me, uh, and that is. Uh, to do with, so when you talk about or the way I understand Africa capitalism, it is, you know, capitalism with a purpose. And, and how, is, how is this scalable in other countries' contexts and, and socio-political environments? Or is it relevant to the, of, to the African context? Thank you, Abhishek. Um, in as much as the, the, the notion was coined or developed with Africa in mind. Um, and I think that's right, because you have, uh, you have a situation there, and that's the slide on the oxymoron, prosperity and uh, poverty co-occurring. I think in any institutional context where you have that, when you have uh, institutional contexts that are similar, then the philosophy may be relevant there. But remember the philosophy also rests on some African values like Ubuntu uh, philosophy, which, you know, um, Southern African orientation of community. So it, it rests on what you may call indigenous African values. So to that extent, uh, where you don't have those values, it may not be relevant. So it is African, but it can be customized in other economic environments. Thank you, thank you indeed. Absolutely, I think that that's, you have answered my question spot on, fantastic. Well, thank you very much again, Emmanuel. And then thank you all of you for you know, making time and attending uh, James Cook University's professorial lecture webinar series. This was the second iteration. We have several more professorial lectures uh, coming up in the future, so please, you know, um, uh, be on a lookout on our website and, and I'm sure you will, um, you know, you can benefit from the sharing of our, our professorate staff, just like what, what Professor Emmanuel um, Edigbate have, have done that today. So again, uh, on behalf of the panel and the audience, Emmanuel, I thank you. And I, my last comment would be to, for the audience, that please, as you leave, make sure that you complete the, the survey that you have. So that it gives us the feedback and you know, opportunity to improve if there's any comments that you may have. Thank you again, Emmanuel, and everyone have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.